Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This will be the continuation of the Jeremiah series. We're going to do chapter 3. And uh, get your King James Bible. Turn it to Jeremiah. Probably one of the most depressing books in all the Bible. It's a book of judgment, but also a book of hope for the repentant remnant. You know, people are always talking about revival. Revival, revival, revival. Well, there is no revival without repentance. Abs all revivals start with repentance and obedience. And when the Lord says sends judgment to a country or his people, they will do one of two things. They will either repent and go to the Lord or they will keep doing what they're doing and be destroyed. Jeremiah 3, verse 1. They say, If a man put away his wife, and we're talking about divorce here, if a man put away his wife, and she grow, go from him and become another man's, you know, another man's wife, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou, I'm talking to Israel here, but thou hast played the harlot, or the whore, with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Now we're going to go into that a little bit later. Verse 2. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places. You know, people, let me tell you what. The high places, that's where uh, probably the Tower of Babel, what they were trying to do, they were trying to build a their little stairway to heaven. A uh, little thing from Led Zeppelin there, right? And you look at the Great Pyramid of Giza. As a matter of fact, a lot of the pyramids, they don't have capstones. They go up and then at top they're flat. Why? There were probably centers of worship. Worshipping on the high places. They are not worshipping the Lord God of heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, Israel. No, they're worshipping the other one, the God of this world. The prince of the power of the air. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arab as the Arabian in the wilderness. You know, an Arab, Arabian, in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Verse 3. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. You know, I was in Texas, and a little tiny town, uh, probably, I don't know if I was on an interstate or a country road or whatever, and stopped at a restaurant, had truck parking. You know, that's the nice thing about going out west. Uh, a lot of places have truck parking. Because wide open spaces. And in the restaurant was somewhat Christian friendly. And they had a thing on the bulletin board. Uh, such and such a church, uh, prayer prayer meeting, you know, and please pray for rain. Well, 
Yeah, praying for rain is all fine and dandy, but, uh, you know, the thing is, no rain is God's calling card telling you that there's something wrong with your lives and your actions. So you can pray for rain all you want, but until there's repentance and turning from wickedness, ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Therefore, the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hadst a, a whore's forehead. And I've mentioned it before. I have no idea what a whore's forehead is. Maybe I should look that up. Well, best I can find is... Uh, God seals us, uh, those that are in Christ, he seals us with the seal in our foreheads. And, well, the mark of the beast is either going to be in the right hand or in the forehead. Uh, so, I, I don't know. A whore's forehead. Thou refuses to be ashamed. Verse 4. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, thou art the guide of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. The Lord also, I'm sorry, the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king. Now remember, Josiah was the king of Judah. Judah and Israel were two separate kingdoms, irregardless of what the lying demonominational church wolves say that claim to be pastors. Okay? They're not the same. They had different land areas, different kings. They had different capitals. They fought wars against each other. Now, sometimes you, Judah is likened, when, when you say Israel, as in all Israel, Judah's in there. But not always. When you're talking about Judah, you're talking about Judah. When you're talking about Israel, sometimes it's uh, part of Israel, sometimes it's all of Israel. And the context will explain such things. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, king of Judah, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. What kind of a harlot? A spiritual harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So, northern Israel had sinned, and uh, southern Judah, her treacherous sister, saw it. So, any repentance? No. No. Not in Israel? Not in Judah. Neither one. Uh-uh. Now, uh, let's go. Jeremiah 3 and verse 8. Those of you that listen to me for a long time, you've heard this before, but I'm going to say it again. And I'm telling you what, Pastor so-called John Hagee, you can go to his church for 30 years and you'll never hear him talk about or repeat this verse. Absolutely Never, 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 ever, never. Did I say never? Verse 8. Lord speaking. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, spiritual adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Wow, God divorced Israel. 
Oh, don't you always hear the pastors uh, so-called saying, well, God has an everlasting covenant with Israel. Oh, really? Then why did he divorce her? Why did the Lord divorce Israel if they have an everlasting covenant? Boy, bring that up in a Bible study in your local church. That'll go over like a lead balloon. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, they'll probably tell you to leave. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah Feared not. Oh, yeah. Judah watched all this stuff going on. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Well, guess what? When God divorced Israel, he sent her into captivity with the Assyrians. Oh, yeah. And Judah watched the whole thing. She knew what was going on. Did she get on her hands and knees and repent and ask the Lord to forgiveness and turn from their wicked ways? Nah, didn't happen. Verse 9, And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. Feigned, as in fake. You know, they would go through the motions. They'd go to the temple and bring a sacrifice, you know. And it's sort of like church people. You know, Sunday morning, they're in church and... They're all, praise the Lord, hallelujah, waving their hands up to the sky. And then Monday through Saturday, they live like the devil and cheat people and lie and everything else. You know, you wouldn't even recognize it's the same people. Uh, a lot of people, it's a show. Sadly, it's a show. So, did Judah turn to the Lord after he, she saw what happened to her sister Israel? No. No, they went to the, you know, they'd go to the temple of the Lord and they'd put on a show and, you know, they would do the little rituals and what have you, but, you know, they were just pretending. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto me, the backsliding Israel, you know, the people that God divorced, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Now, why did the Lord divorce Israel but not Judah? Because the Lord made a promise with King David that Judah would always have a man to sit upon the throne. And guess what? Christ was uh, sitting on the throne. And a lot of preachers will say, oh, well, you know, when uh, the uh, Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, took Jerusalem into captivity, that was the end of the kings of Judah. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a minute. You take a look at the royalty of Europe. And I am of the opinion, probably many of them are, if you go back far enough, probably descended from Judah. Because a big portion of Judah was taken into captivity during the Assyrian Empire. See, the Assyrians tried to take Jerusalem, but they were unable to do it because an angel of the Lord struck, uh, I think it was 185,000 of their troops with blindness. That was the end of the siege of Jerusalem. See, Judah knew what had happened to Israel. They knew. They saw it firsthand. 
You know, they were starving when the Assyrians had uh, surrounded Jerusalem. But uh, did they repent? No. Matter of fact, one woman resorted to uh, killing and eating her own son. That's how bad things are. And you know what, people? All these aborted children, they're ending up in our food. Yeah. Everybody thinks that's a big joke. Ha, ha, ha. Well, it's not. When you get a, some, a thing that says natural flavors, beware, people. Beware. I know, I'm just full of good news, aren't I? But you know what? As bad as Israel was that got divorced, they were not probably they were probably not half as bad as Judah had become. Verse 11, and the Lord said unto me, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, now the kingdom of Israel was north of Judah and Jerusalem. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return, return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. And I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Good thing for that, because if the Lord kept his anger forever, we got a big problem. Verse 13, only acknowledge thine iniquity. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Acknowledge our iniquity and turn from it. Quit doing it. You know, it's, it's not like you go to an alcoholic or, or uh, narcotics anonymous meeting where you're bragging. Oh, yeah, man, I used to drink a, a, a quart of vodka before dinner time, you know. Or I used to be able to do, uh, you know, this much dope, you know. Oh, yeah, man, I was a great dope user, you know. That's not, that's bragging. The Lord wants you to admit your sin and then turn from it. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. And has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. Who are the strangers? Probably the you know idolatrous priests. Maybe they were fallen angels. I don't know. Probably both. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. For I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Wow. See, the first half of this verse was judgment. But now, the remnant is going to be saved. One of a city or two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors, you know, like ministers, pastors, not, uh, not a, a bunch of grass where the sheep and the cow can graze. No, not that kind of pasture. No, pastors. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I won't be looking for John Hagee there, but uh, eh, you never know. Verse 16. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, 
the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Uh, you know what, people? When you hear people say, Oh, his name is not Jesus. There was no J in Hebrew. And J is a new letter that's only been in existence for about 400 years. There's no J in Jesus. So Jesus is not his name. Well, guess what? Tell him, well, I guess Jerusalem doesn't exist, right? Because there's no J in Jesus. There's no J in Jerusalem. And I can show you uh, Bibles from the uh, I got a 1917 copy well PDF of the uh, Old Testament scriptures from the Jewish Publication Society of Philadelphia Pennsylvania I guess Jews don't exist either since there's no J in Jesus and that Bible says Jerusalem. So when they start feeding you that no J in Jesus, uh, well, there's no Jews, there's no Jerusalem either, right? Lying heretic. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Well, that hasn't happened yet because when Christ returns, then it will happen. Jerusalem's going to be the throne of the Lord. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their wicked heart. Ah, okay. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 7. and uh, We'll start in verse 9. Uh, I'm going to skip the... Um, the 144,000 that are sealed. Because we pretty much all know, we should all know about that, right? So, Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed, with white robes and palms in their hands. And cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. I mean, he's asking, you know, who are these that are, you know, have on the white robes and where did they come from? And he says, oh, well, you know, you know, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So that's the, uh, that's the throne, right? Now, Zion is not going to happen until 
Jesus returns and New Jerusalem. Where is this found? Well, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12 says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 21 and verse, well, we'll read verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned, for her husband. Wow. New Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. All right. Revel uh, Jeremiah 3, 17. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Well, sorry. Modern day so-called Zionism is not the throne of the Lord. It's going to be the throne of the Antichrist. When you hear people tell you that uh, Rome is uh, going to be the seat of the Antichrist, uh, you know you're not, you're, you're either talking to somebody that has a very limited Bible knowledge and shouldn't even be teaching you, or they're deceivers. No. Satan wants to rule from Jerusalem, God's throne. And he's going to defile Jerusalem. That's why there's going to be a new Jerusalem. Because the old one is going to be, well, already is, defiled. Big time defiled. Oh, it's going to be Rome. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not Rome. Rome is a smokescreen, people. It's a deception. It's a red herring. For those of you that, yeah, never mind. At the time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north. And they shall come together out of the land of the north. What land is north of Jerusalem? Europe, people. Europe. Where did Israel go? Europe. Who built all the churches? Europe. Who printed all the Bibles? Europe. Who translated the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament into Many different languages, Europeans and Americans. Think about it. Where did Paul go for his missionary journeys to the Gentiles, so-called? He went to Greece. He went to Italy. He went to Galatia, which some people say it was that was France. Come on, people. There's a reason for all this. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. You see, Israel departed from the Lord. The Lord didn't depart from Israel. His people. A voice was heard upon the high places 
weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the, the Lord their God. Sounds like America and Europe today and the United Kingdom, England, UK, whatever you want to call it. Great Britain, which is not so great anymore. I'm sorry I'm not bashing you from the UK. America's not so great either. We're bankrupt. We are bankrupt. When they get through printing all this money, there's going to be uh, hell to pay. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to pay hell. It's bad. We're bankrupt. America's bankrupt. Morally, spiritually, just like the rest of Europe. And they have forgotten the Lord their God. But there is a solution. Verse 22. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. You know, you want to go to the hills and worship on top of the hills to the host of heaven, the fallen angels? That salvation is vain. Vain means worthless. It's useless. Truly in vain is salvation to hope for from the hill and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God. Those are three of the the Lord's favorite words to hear. We have sinned. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Well, listen to this. Mark 6, 12. And they went out, the apostles, and they went out and preached that men should repent. Well, then you got people who say, well, repent just means to uh, go from unbelief to belief. Have faith. You know, believe in the Lord. But is that what repent means? Luke 3, 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance, repentance for the remission of sins. Huh. Luke 5, 32. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Does that sound like uh, unbelief to belief? No. Why is he talking? Why does he say righteous? No. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, the Lord wants us to repent. Luke 13, 3. I'm sorry. Yeah. And Luke 13, 5. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3 and Luke 13, 5. Exact replica. You know, I always learned in college that when an instructor said, repeated something more than once, you better write it down and remember it because it's going to be on the test. Well, guess what? This life is a test. Luke 15 and verse 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Uh, if, it, if it meant just unbelief, it, he would have said uh, that 
Likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one unbeliever that believes. But it doesn't say that. It says one sinner that repenteth. More than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Huh. Luke 15.10 Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. You see, repenting has reference to sin. God wants us to acknowledge our sin and turn from it. Don't listen to famous internet preachers that tell you that repenting just means to believe. They're liars. And then they'll try to confuse the issue where God repenting with our repenting. God is not a sinner that needs to repent. Sometimes he repents and changes his mind about judgment. But don't confuse that with our needing repentance. Acts 2.38, Peter, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now remember, in Matthew 22, verse 36, someone asked Jesus, what was the most important commandment? He says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all, all the law and the prophets. Now remember, the Lord said to live amongst your own kind. You know, and what did Josiah do? He got rid of the wicked ones. He broke down the houses of the uh, so dumb ites that live next to the temple you know they lived in uh, the city of sodom yeah that type yeah yeah the so dumb ites uh replace the uh u with a o right so that's what you know that's what the Lord wants from us. Acknowledging that we've sinned. Turning from that sin. Loving the Lord. Loving our neighbor. I mean, that's basically it in a nutshell. Now remember, God divorced Israel in Jeremiah 3.8. But there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, there was a thing. Now, I don't want to get into it too deep. I'm just going to point it out. That a woman, when her husband died, a wife, she became a widow, and the widow was free to remarry. Well, what happened to Christ on the cross? His body died. Her bride, the bride, her husband had died. Bride and died. Hmm. I didn't try to make that rhyme, but it just worked out that way. Well, guess what? He was resurrected. Now, the bride is free of her old husband and is free to marry again. So, is there going to be another wedding? Yes! Yes, there is. 
In Revelation 19.7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. People, that's what the purpose of the tribulation period is going to be, the time of Jacob's trouble, to get the wife ready. Right now, the Lord, his wife, is not ready. Right now, she's concerned about the cares of this world. But by the time, by the time the tribulations are almost over, the bride is going to be begging for her groom to return. Wait and see if I'm right or if I'm wrong. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. All right, this is the end of part three, Jeremiah. Chaplain Bob Walker here. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.